With the Daytona 500 starting the NASCAR season, a driver's year can be made with one 200-lap race. One February afternoon can make a nine-month season all worth it. And in 2011, this was on full display. With the new year came new as well as returning stories. The biggest returning story would be the 10-year anniversary of Dale Earnhardt's passing. This would, ironically enough, be highlighted in three ways before the 500. Firstly, was Michael Waltrip running a commemorative paint scheme towards his 2001 Daytona 500 victory in honor of Earnhardt. On the Friday night before the 500, in the truck race, 10 years exactly to the day of the 2001 500, Mikey would win the truck race in another commemorative 15 scheme in that race. And for the 500, the Sunday before, qualifying would see Dale Earnhardt Jr. pilot his number 88 Amp Energy Chevrolet to the pole position. When it came to the new storylines, though, there were plenty. Both in Cup and nationwide, the cars were changing. NASCAR's lower series would have their first year with their COT that we currently see today. This brought on a nail-biter with Tony Stewart winning his fourth consecutive Nationwide Series season opener at Daytona. In Cup, the overly pronounced COT splitter was covered by a more practical, aerodynamically and aesthetically pleasing bumper. In these cars, there'd be big moves as well, like Casey Kane to Team Red Bull. Mark Sambros to RPMs 9, and Paul Menard to RCR. All of these guys would have big effects on the 2011 season and 500 in more ways than one. One of these other big moves was part-timer and 20-year-old Trevor Bain in the Wood Brothers 21 Ford, but we'll get to him later. The other two were the Penske duo, as there was a swap. The two would be piloted by young Brad Keselowski, who would end up winning the 2012 championship with this team the next year. Kurt Busch would be in the Shell 22, and that is a team and sponsorship partner that's still around today. And with it, his 22 Dodge would make waves in speed weeks, winning the Budweiser shootout, and then five days later, the first of the Gatorade duels. You may notice that the racing at Daytona in general looked way different compared to the classic Daytona packs that people are used to. Both the cars and the track looked way different. For the first time since 1979, the Daytona International Speedway was repaved. The 500 had a great moment last time there was a repave, so perhaps it could happen again. And the racing style was a full-blown two-car tandem race. The tandem drafts had been seldomly seen in 2008 and 2009, but seen in famous moments, like Carl Edwards' giant flip at the end of the 2009 Aaron's 499. And it was probably due to Talladega being recently repaved. But in 2010 at Talladega, it was the name of the game, punctuated by Kevin Harvick's nail-biting victory over Jamie McMurray. But now... The entire race was two-car drafts. Overall, it was a brand new year, and there was a brand new feeling to it. In front of nearly 200,000 strong at the track, the 2011 season was under green. In respect to Dale Earnhardt, much like 2001, NASCAR and Fox alike had a silent lap three, with fans at the track holding a three-finger salute for the Intimidator. As they come off four and complete lap two, NASCAR, NASCAR on Fox and Daytona pay tribute to the man in black, Dale Earnhardt, on this, the third lap of the race. seven championships or all of his victories but the advances in safety in NASCAR that followed that dark day in 2001. 
Quickly after, Michael Waltrip got into Kyle Busch, causing a yellow flag. And after a few more non-contact cautions, this wreck would show to be a precursor. Closer about, together than most people park. Yeah, 200 miles an hour with somebody pushed. Trouble turn oh, three. Big wreck. Brian Kozlowski, David Rudeman, Michael Mike Waltrip, Big. Matt Kenseth, Big and wreck. half the field. I see about three of the Hendrick cars there that's Mark, involved. Mark Martin is there. I see him. There's a Biffle. Jimmy Johnson's laying over there. There's a 24 car. Looks pretty bad. This started the main trend of the day, for the most part, of issues caused by messing up tandem drafts. Add to this the hot weather on the slick new service, and this race was going to be a treacherous one. Whether it was teammates, friends, or whoever you could find, the tandems were endless and erratic. Because of the back car overheating, though, each duo would have to swap the order every couple laps and subsequently lose speed. This caused a spread out field and race with copious lead changes throughout. This also meant that there was no truly dominant car. Sure, Kurt Busch spent a lot of time up front like he had in the previous two races of Speed Weeks, but he wasn't dominant. Dale Jr. was fast, but he wasn't. Arts Yarn Ganassi, their boys were pretty good. They had speed, but not ultimate dominating speed. None of them were dominant whatsoever. But one very strong drafter, who we earlier referenced in the 21 car by the name of Trevor Bain, well, he was somebody in the mix as well. As long as he stayed out of trouble, he'd be in the mix at the end of the day as well. With the issues both mechanically popping up as well as those spinning out, the race slowly became one of attrition as well. But with the spread out racing, it did also mean that as long as you didn't hit the wall or get turned into another car right away, you could recover. Juan Pablo Montoyo being the big example in this race along with Kyle Busch. With so many small incidents, the last 93 laps of the scheduled distance saw the longest green flag run lasting only 12 laps. This probably also compounded itself time and time again with more of that time running out. But with the field so spread out and the disparity of the speeds, it was hard to judge when to go. It could be 24 to go, but still have too much time to actually make a move or try and make your way a couple seconds up the field. The defining and changing moment that made the charge to the finish happen would be a Casey Kane accident and the restart that led off into the final laps after that. With under 10 to go, the true contenders were split into pairs, but much like an accordion, they went from being spread out to all coming back together. 12 cars, six pairs of drafters, all working together until four to go. The 33 of Boyer, the 18 of Kyle Busch, they're blocked. They can't go anywhere right now because they're three wide in front of them. Six times a driver has scored his first sprint. Oh! oh! Smith gets turned in front of Boyer and Newman and Hamlin. With this wreck, David Reagan and Trevor Bain would be the two leaders working together. If they could execute a green-white checker restart, one of them would be almost ensured to win their first race ever in the Great American Race. Green flag. Perfect. Good hesitation. Now if they can get hooked up and push. And Tony timed it a little better, but can Bobby but, Labonte get up there to help Tony Stewart, or is he a man alone? He's in no man's land. I just don't know if he can hang out there. But look at the two Bush brothers, Kurt Bush in the 22 and Kyle Bush in the 18, working the high side. I'm hearing they're going, oh, we got a car around. Got a car around right Bobby there. Bobby Gordon Safe. saves it. But the, the six is being black flag, passing before the uh, start-finish line. And now they got it. Now Newman, got Newman again. Around. Ryan Newman oh, hits no, the wall. Oh, no, Junior. Truex and Junior. Oh, no, Come and on. here's Truex. Caution is out. The restart was too good for Reagan because he cut down in front of the 21 too early, breaking a NASCAR rule about lane changes. For this, he would be unceremoniously removed from the lead. Now, it'd be Trevor Bain up front trying to hold off the field, paired with 2,000 NASCAR Cup champion Bobby Labonte. They would both run off. Cars out. Ready. Tony Stewart's won the pole for the Indy 500. He's won the IRL championship. Twice the Sprint Cup championship. He's won everything at Daytona.
And coming through the middle, Kurt Busch. Now down to the inside. Bobby Labonte in that 47 gave Trevor Bain a heck of a push. Now all they can do is try to hug the bottom of the racetrack and protect. I like what I'm, I tell you, that 22, though, is coming in a, with a head of steam. And Juan Pablo right on him. Looks like Tony and Mark might have a, I don't know if they got enough time to get back up there or not. I don't think they do. Dale Jr. checked and released at the infield care center. They'll face the white flag when they come around to decide the 53rd Daytona 500. Rookie Trevor Bain in his second Sprint Cup start will lead them to the white flag with Bobby Labonte. Here comes Kurt Busch and Juan Montoya. Carl Edwards in fifth. And we know Kurt Busch and Montoya is going to make a move. DW, when will they make it? I don't think they're going to make it till turn four. I mean, we keep hearing about I'm a set and duck when I'm leading this thing. So I guess that makes the 21 a set and duck right now. But we'll see here that 22 knows how to win from that position. That's where he won the butt shootout from. Edwards and Gilliland down to the inside trying to. Where did that 34 come from? Trying to Gilliland. spoil the party. Oh, and my they God. spoiled the party for Kurt Busch and Montoya. And here they come through turn four. Are they former pole sitter of the 500. Edwards has room underneath. Now he pushes Trevor Bain. It's over. Cinderella Trevor Bain is going to win the Daytona. Birthday, Trevor Bain, 20 years old. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you, uh, what? That was awesome. That was awesome, Trevor. You are the man, buddy. You are the man. 20-year-old Trevor Bain would pull off arguably the greatest underdog miracle win in NASCAR history, starting off one of the best recent seasons in NASCAR memory. While Trevor Bain never carved out a long-standing successful career, this moment alone etched his name into the history books of the sport. And this race, for that reason, will be forever remembered because of him. Now, with that, I want to pass this on to you and ask, what is your favorite Daytona 500 moment? Let me know down in the comments below. Where you're at it, leave a like in this video, share this video, and subscribe to the channel for more great NASCAR content. And be sure to check out the NASCAR Weekly Podcast tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on Danny B. Talk's channel. Going to be a ton of fun. We got a ton to talk about. So be sure to be there. And until then, have a good one.